Hi there, I'm Pastor Bill Evans, Chetwin Fellowship Baptist Church, um, part of the Chet TV programming. We're quite glad to help out and be part of this program to share. And people are locked in at home and can't get out to church in the COVID season and whatever, but uh, we're glad to help. And so uh, I trust God will bless us in our time together today. We look at uh, some thoughts from His Word that will hopefully encourage us and instruct us. I'm actually going to use a, a pretty well-known story, but... I drew it because of this season. We're in springtime and also Easter is coming. And uh, those, that's concept in spring of re re renewal and rejuvenation. rejuvenation. My, I already have my tulips are up like this and the deer are being fenced out of them already and other little plants are coming. And so we, we've, with the winter we, we sleep and in spring we start to awake and get up and uh, wander out and get our first cup of coffee. And then the Easter season is about renewal and uh, uh, blessings there of uh, the, the Easter story, what Christ came to do for on our behalf. And so we want to just consider a well-known story today from John chapter 11. And that well-known story is the story of uh, Lazarus. And uh, Lazarus was a man that um, we see in the passage here. I'll put on my glasses so I can see a little better as I make reference to it. There was a certain man who uh, was sick, Lazarus of Bethany in the village of um, Mary and Martha. A couple of, so these are three friends of Jesus. And um, he, uh, uh, Lazarus gets sick and Jesus is not there. So uh, they, they send off a, a message. And the first thing we want to consider here in the story is the story happens uh, in a world of human need. And that's what's applicable for us today. We, we have the COVID, we have just so many other things, so much need in the world on all fronts and all counts, and there's so much need. And um, this story, just like that, in a, in a world of need, uh, this story takes place. And um, so the first thing we see in sickness and pain and sadness, uh, these uh, girls, they, they know that Jesus um, loves them. And uh, he, uh, it says, so they sent somebody off. They, they sent somebody off of the commission. Go find Jesus and tell him. Um, you know, over the, through history, uh, Jesus, they probably sent a runner, somebody to run, run the 26, kilom 26 miles or 26 kilometers or whatever it is in the uh, Olympic races started, run. And that's where that stemmed from. And uh, run and, and tell Jesus. Now today, we, uh, later on in life, we had, the, uh, we had the Morse code and the, uh, uh, that tapping and whatever and send a message. And that was during the war times. Uh, they sent messages that way. And then we had the telephone. You just picked up the phone and you phoned grandma and you phoned your mother on Mother's Day and tied up all the lines talking to your mom and whatever. And then today, what do we have? But we got technology where you can look at each other in a phone. But the important thing in the message is, is they got a hold of Jesus, sent him a message. Um, that's, that's what it says there. They sent Jesus a message. And what they said in the message is that guy, that friend of yours that you're really fond of, uh, brotherly love fondness, you're, you're really fond of him, uh, he is sick. And so Jesus understands in their, their comment that they want him to come and to see if he can get there in time to, uh, to heal him and to save him. In verse 5, an interesting statement, it says, Now Jesus uh, loved Martha, uh, with a, and Martha and her sister and Lazarus, these three, these fa this family, he loved them with a dear, godlike love, and says he loved them. And then he makes this statement, though, so in verse 6, he says, So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days longer. Like, doesn't that strike you strange? My friend, the lesson in that story is God's ways are not our ways. God's ways are past finding out. Why would Jesus take and spend two days longer when he's asked, your friend is sick, and they want him to come with expediency. And, and you know there's a Greek word, uh, uh, to, to be diligent, to do something quickly, and the word is spudo, from where we get speedo, your swimsuit. Get on your speedo and get over here and uh, just do that quickly, I think is in their, their, their cry. And Jesus spends two days God's ways are not our ways, and that's important for us to remember when we go through life, we're able to come to God. I wrote here a note that says, the expression we have in the world, that you look at that story and say, well, well, why would Jesus spend two days more? Purposely knowing that his friend is sick. Purposely knowing. Well, God's ways are different than ours, and God's got plans of how he intends to work things out. So he stays there for two days. 
Now the story goes on with a bunch, and we'll skip down to verse 14, and here's what it says. So Jesus then, his disciples started to find out that the story about Lazarus was happening, and Lazarus was sick, and Lazarus was sleeping. And if it, they said, well, if he's sleeping, well, he'll do well, he'll get better. And, um, but then you know, finally Jesus says, oh, guys, Lazarus is dead. D-E-A-D, -E dead. Very dead, not alive. Um, he's gone. Lazarus is dead. And then Jesus makes this interesting statement. I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. I'm glad that I wasn't there, but for your sakes, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And so off his disciples and he go to uh, see this family where Lazarus is sick, but now he has died, uh, Jesus says to them. So um, we, we find here Lazarus being dead. When they get there in verse uh, uh, 16, and it happens, no, nope, uh, verse 17. So they came to and found the place where, where, where Lazarus was living, and they got there. Guess what? He's already been dead four days, count them, undo toi, cats. Um, four days he's dead already, and uh, there he is. And uh, like, what on earth? You delayed two days, and by the time they get there, he's already been dead four. So how long that guy, how far away that guy, how long it took him to get there, we don't know. But Jesus delayed in coming, and now that Lazarus has already been dead and uh, buried for four days. That's the story in the world and the human need, how this story uh, unfolded. And uh, one more thing happens. When Martha finds out that Jesus is coming, she runs out to meet him. And uh, she makes this interesting statement um, in uh, the verse there, whatever. Martha, therefore, sure was Jesus come and went to meet him. And in verse 21, she says, Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. There's the human tragedy in the world we live. Human tragedy goes on all around us. We, we cry out to God, God, where were you? If you'd have been right here, if you'd have been, but if you'd have been done, but done something, my loved one would not have died. My loved one would not have done whatever. My loved one would not have uh, lost all that they lost. They would not have lost their house or done whatever. God, if you were there. But the challenge I want to leave with you uh, today with that thought is that God's ways are not our ways. God's timing is not our timing. God is a, a, a nick in time God. He comes in the nick of time because he shows his power and he shows up in the right time in the right place. And in the one verse in the scripture says, in the fullness of time, God. And he takes his time to do what needs to be done for us. And as a pastor, I get to see that in people's lives. And I get to remember the time we've prayed together, we kept contact together, waiting for something to come up and come back and come around and whatever, and it keep doesn't happening. Hang in there, God is faithful. And if you had been here, she said to Jesus, my brother would not have died. Well, in the story here, the answer begins to be outworked. It begins to be outworked. And here what we find is uh, after she makes that statement to Jesus, Jesus then says to her, um, he says, uh, now this, a, a human element comes into this of her faith. And that's, that's an issue for people sometimes, is um, trying to remember um, that God wants us to exercise faith. Faith in Him, that He's bigger than us and bigger than our circumstance. And so uh, she, she comes and she says, but Lord, I know that even now, I'm intimate with this knowledge that whatever you ask God, God will give you. She, she believes in the power of prayer. If I could just get Jesus, if you pray, God can do something to make this story better for us. There were people there come from a ways to greet them and to be with them in their time of grief, to mourn with them and whatever. But she comes to Jesus. If you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know whatever you ask, God will give you. I don't know what she had in her mind, what was supposed to happen here, because she just uh, seemed to be upset with Jesus that he wasn't there. And um, had he been, her brother would not have died. So now I know whatever you ask of God, he will give you. And then... She asked that statement there, and then further on down, uh, Jesus is going to make verse 23 a statement. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha shows that she's got some understanding of Jewish theology. Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And uh, I know that'll happen. But I don't understand when she says the first part there, I know whatever you ask God can happen, but I know he'll rise again. What was she thinking if, if she wasn't thinking that he could be raised now, as you might know the story? Jesus had said to her, your brother will rise again. She says, I know he'll rise again in the last days. 
And then uh, Jesus brings us to uh, a divine approach to this story. And here's what he says to Jesus, uh, to Martha. Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Jesus makes this interesting statement. He says, I am the bread of life. In the Jewish mind, you know, G Jesus got in trouble for using that very terminology. He used two Greek words that tie together to make this expression that he was the Jehovah of the Old Testament. When, when uh, the story of Moses, uh, Moses was, says, God, uh, you tell me to go lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. Uh, who shall I tell them uh, has sent me? And he, you tell them, well, the I am, the I am that I am has sent you. I am that I am. And Jesus keeps using this terminology. And it drove, drove the Jewish rulers of his day crazy with their religious approach and religious thinking. That you cannot say you're the I am. He kept saying I am. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I, I am the water of life. And I am and I am. And here he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And the resurrection and the life that uh, the children of God will enjoy at the end of the world is also a practical thing for us today. We don't have to demand of God that our loved ones be raised. But were it necessary, he can do it. But our idea is that we be trust and have confidence in him. So he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me uh, will live even if he dies. And I, I can get you back from the dead if I need you back. But I can also help you walk through the valley of the shadow of death and face eternity and be found on heaven's shore. But he says, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he makes this statement to Martha. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? And then Martha is brought to the point um, of understanding. Um, everyone who lives and believes. Uh, Jesus is, uh, they'll never die. He, he makes this statement. But then he concludes with it. Do you believe this? And that's the challenge of the answer to our life's problems uh, that we face in a world of hurt and pain and whatever it is this. Jesus says, show me you have faith in what my power is. Martha seemed to hint at that and, and whatever. So she makes this statement, do you believe this? She says to him, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God who, who comes into the world. I have believed that. So I, I, I believed it there. It's, it's alive in my life. Well, now he wants her to embrace, embrace and rely on that thought. And we find as you go on in the story, uh, the divine part comes in. And uh, you can read the rest of the story for yourself, how Lazarus is raised from the dead and whatever. The final answer is found in this. And um, uh, are you believing and understanding what I say, that I am the resurrection and the life? The eternal God is, is me in the flesh, Jesus says, and I've come here to be in your presence. She says, yes, I've believed that. Um, a closing verse is found in verse 5 of this chapter. I skipped it on purpose. When they said, Behold, your brother is sick, John, who's writing much later, says, But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified by it. And so we hear, see, Jesus telling Martha that, Hey, um, I'm here to encourage you that I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe, I'll work the problem out. As we come to God in faith, like Martha had a faith in Jesus, faith in God that he was who he said he was and God was who he was. She found an answer and she received her brother raised from the dead. God doesn't have to do that a whole lot. He's got examples to show his power is there. Were it necessary, he can do it. He wants us to trust. And if we do our part, he'll walk with us and encourage our hearts. In the Easter season, may your heart be blessed and encouraged because Jesus was res resurrected to help with the struggles we face in life. Amen.